So Jews are continually told that we can't have the whole of uh, Israel and the disputed territories and the Palestinians aren't. And you, you raised UNRWA, which is something you've written a lot about. So the United States has recently withdrawn a lot of funding uh, from, from that organization. New Zealand continues to give a million dollars a year, which in the grand scheme of things is not a huge amount, but for New Zealand it's a lot, uh, and never publicly said anything bad about UNRWA as an organization. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? So a little bit about UNRWA to understand, because amazingly it's the most important topic for peace and the one that is least known about and least understood, which in itself is a bit amazing because you think so many words have been written, so much has been said, but actually on the key issue, very little is known. And the key issue is that from the Arab and Palestinian perspective, Israel is still temporary. And that's the fundamental thing to understand. From the Arab view and especially the Palestinian view, the whole Zionist project, the idea of the return of the Jews to the land, the establishment of a modern sovereign state, that's an aberration in history. That's an aberration in Arab and Islamic history of the region. So it's not to last. Uh, Arabs often call Israel the second crusader state, implying that just as the first crusader state of the 11th century lasted a few decades, so will this one. It's a, it's a state of foreigners, people who will ultimately leave. There's no acceptance of the idea that the Jews are an indigenous people who have come home. So from the notion that Israel is temporary, a lot of things follow. And one of them is the Palestinian idea that even though they lost the war to prevent partition and to prevent the establishment of the state of Israel. In 47. Yes. The war in 47, they may have lost that battle, but the war still goes on. Israel might have established itself, Israel might have declared independence, but the war still goes on, which means that it can still be rolled back. This is temporary. And how is this idea that Israel can be rolled back is kept alive? Through this idea of return. We may have lost the war, say the Palestinians. We were displaced as a result of a war that they opened. They were displaced as a result of the war. In parentheses, that's when displacement begins. People present Zionism as a movement of displacement, but had Arabs agree to partition, no one would have been displaced. It's only by opening war against partition that they were displaced because they lost the war. But in their mind, this displacement was unjust. They forget that they started the war. They, for, they conveniently forget that there was an annihilationist war to prevent the state of Israel from being established, to prevent the Jews from being sovereign, from being equal. So now they maintain that they and their descendants in perpetuity, we are now into the fifth generation, have the right to overturn Israel and free that area, make it Arab again, by going there. Uh, and this is the idea of return. And UNRWA keeps it alive. UNRWA keeps it alive by having a whole agency with the words UN about it, that, that actually give international legitimacy. What a country like New Zealand and other Western countries don't understand is even if it's a million dollars, you are annually giving legitimacy to the Palestinian Arab idea that Israel is temporary and will one day become an Arab state with a Jewish minority where Jews are back to their proper place. It's nothing less than that. Now, I know New Zealand diplomats would say, oh, no, it's just humanitarian and it's a final status issue. But my favorite comparison is this. I say, if your policy in New Zealand on UNRWA, on the settlements, looked like your policy on UNRWA, this is what your policy and the settlements would look like. Go ahead, settlers. Go and build everywhere you want across Judea and Samaria. It's a final status issue. We don't want to prejudice a final status issue. You know what? We're going to give a billion and a half dollars. That's what the entire international community gives. So they 
annually so that you can do your settlement project. We're never going to tell you that you will have to leave your homes. We're, we're, we're going to avoid telling you that. But we really trust that when the day comes to make peace, divide the land, and establish a sovereign Palestinian state, we will approach this with good faith and in a way that ensures the ability of a Palestinian state to emerge. Now, obviously, all diplomats, when I present it to them, think this is absurd. So I tell them, but this is what you're doing with UNRWA. You're telling the Arab Palestinians, generation after generation, year after year, go ahead and continue believing in the idea that Israel is temporary and that you and your descendants will one day can overturn the establishment of the state of Israel. We will give a billion and a half dollars to you continuing to believe in that with the letters UN so that you will know that the world is with you in that. Uh, we will never tell you that this is not going to happen. We don't want to hurt your feelings. And we trust you that when the day comes to sit and negotiate with Israel a final peace agreement that allows the Jewish people a sovereign state in at least part of the land, you will do so in good faith. It's, it's equally absurd. So the, the UN Israeli settlement organization uh, would be the equivalent of UNRWA? Precisely. But dismantling UNRWA, many people would say, would be the end of humanitarian aid and food and housing and schooling for Palestinian refugees. How would you deal with those issues if so, UNRWA was dismantled? So once you understand what UNRWA really is, which is an organization that keeps alive Palestinian maximalism and the idea that Israel is temporary, then you can approach the actual issues very easily. In the areas where UNRWA operates, in the West Bank, in Gaza, in Jordan, in Syria, and in Lebanon, there are actually alternative possibilities for the supply of schooling and health care. The Jordanian government, most uh, people who are serviced by UNRWA in Jordan are actually citizens of Jordan. More than 80% of them don't live in camps. The Jordanian government can get the money and supply the services. These are not people who should be brought up to think that they can overturn Israel. In the West Bank, you have the Palestinian Authority that already operates a parallel school system. So uh, they should get the money. In Gaza, there are numerous other aid organizations that can do it, and the same in Syria and Lebanon. So you can handle the practical questions uh, and divorce it from the political question. What UNRWA does very well is mask its political goal behind this thin facade that says, oh no, we're just doing good stuff. No, they're not. The good stuff that they supposedly do is used as a cover to keep alive this Palestinian maximalist idea. All of the services UNRWA provides can be provided by other countries, bodies, where the people live. And this way you can dismantle the idea that Israel is temporary, or at least we're not going to dismantle it in the mind of Arabs and Palestinians anytime soon. But you can rob it of international support. Right now, when they think that Israel is temporary, they don't think they're alone. And that's important. They need to understand that they don't have the world's backing when they want to overturn Israel. Just as Jews in the territories know that they're alone in their maximalist vision. They think maybe God is with them, but they know that the world is not with them. The same way I want Arab Palestinians, just like the settlers, to understand that they might have their maximalist visions, but they're alone in this. And it's high time that they begin to develop a more realistic vision of a state in the West Bank and Gaza, and that's it. There will be nothing that is Israel within the Green Line. Realistic is uh, an interesting word to use when you say that there are uh, Arab Palestinians who are citizens of Jordan, and yet they're counted as refugees. Yes. Uh, that sounds like a completely unrealistic label to give people uh, if they are citizens. 
The whole idea of calling Palestinians refugees has nothing to do with being refugees. But they like to play with the word. Because when you think of a refugee, what do you think? A refugee is someone who just escaped war. They're fleeing some kind of uh, oppression, maybe. Uh, they're huddled in a tent, open to the winds. You don't think of them as a citizen of a country who's a middle-class lawyer or a successful business person. But those are the Palestinian refugees. Uh, because they are not refugees. The idea of being called refugees is a political use of a word in order to say the war is not over. Even after 70 years, the war is not over, and therefore we can still imagine ourselves as winning this war for rolling back Israel and going back, even though we've never been there. And. Um, and I will add this, to people sometimes say, well, how can you support the return of the Jewish people after 2,000 years to the land, but deny the return of Arab Palestinians after 70 years to the land? I actually say this, we need to acknowledge both returns, and then we need to territorially limit both returns. The Jews have a right to return, and the Arab Palestinians have a right to return. But neither can have the superior and exclusive right. So the Jews need to limit their return to the Green Line, broadly speaking, and the Arab Palestinians need to limit their return to the West Bank and Gaza. That's where they will have their state, to which they will return. Look, the Jews have a historical connection to Judea that is much more than Tel Aviv. You know, I live in Tel Aviv, I, would, I love Tel Aviv, but even I acknowledge that the Judean people, which is how Jews are called in all languages except English and, Hebrew and uh, French, the Judean people were born in Judea, but I'm saying we will give up Judea understanding that there is another people with another claim. But they cannot have everything and we cannot have everything. So let's make, by and large, the green line the line that separates the claim. We can continue dreaming of each other's land. They will dream of Jaffa, we will dream of Judea. But as legal claims that have global support, that cannot happen. Right. And so the, the war is ongoing, uh, and it's very much a political war at the moment. And one of the, the forefronts of this political war is the boycott, divestment and sanctions movement, BDS. So I'm not sure if you're aware, we had uh, um, a Kiwi superstar, Lord, uh, yes. who uh, cancelled her show in Israel, but continued to play in many other countries around the world. Uh, I wonder your thoughts on, on BDS. The problem with BDS is that it is precisely able to rope in well-meaning people, uh, who I'm sure the singer Lord is. Uh, they, they want peace, they want to do good, uh, and the way that they're being roped in is that they're kind of told stories of uh, Palestinian misery and difficulty, and these stories exist, but they're always out of context. And that's the thing, they're presented as kind of just victims in a vacuum where you only have evil Israel, and that's where we go back to the, the notion of telling the story of Israel and Zionism as something sinister and evil that only wants to cause suffering to unsuspecting innocent Palestinians, completely neglecting the context of Arab and Palestinian rejection of the idea of the Jewish people as equals and as people with the right to sovereignty and as an indigenous people who have the right to sovereignty in their homeland where they were created as a people. So all of that is swept aside and BDS basically only speaks of rights, of justice, the only rights and the only justice is always on the Arab side. There's no notion that the Jews have the right to self-determination, that they have a cause which is just, the cause of self-determination and to be masters of their faith. Uh, and as a result, they say, we only want rights, 
they talk about the right of return again kind of conveniently hiding that the right of return is conceived of as war by any other means as a way to again erase israel erase the idea of a sovereign jewish people who have the right to be masters of their fate so they get unsuspecting well-meaning people with high profiles uh, to say look you want to do good in the world you want to use your power your celebrity for good boycott israel they compare it to the south african boycott again kind of highlighting zionism israel as evil apartheid was is evil israel is evil and they completely erase any notion of arab palestinian agency in leading to where we are today uh, it's important to say the day that the arab palestinians will say the war is over we accept that you, the Jewish people, are an indigenous people who have come home. It's crazy, but we accept it. But you cannot have it all, and we understand that we cannot have it all, so let's draw the line. And that day is the day we have peace. And it's not because Israeli and Jews are just lovely, wonderful people. It's simply because we're a small people and we recognize that if the entire Arab world, which is 60 times our size, the Muslim world, which is more than 100 times our size, will be willing to finally let us be and accept us as equals rather than people who know their place, of course we're gonna say yes. We always said yes. We said yes to partition in 37 and 47, in 67, in 2000, 2008. We always said yes. So people who support BDS out of goodwill should really look more and understand that it is a movement intended to roll back Israel, to deny the Jewish people their justice, their rights, and no one who wants peace should support that. And of course the great irony is that at the moment that the Arab world, as a result of its internal turmoil, is beginning to move away from using the Palestinians as the vanguard of the battle against the Zionist invader, at the moment when Arab countries are beginning to look at Israel differently, you're seeing the West, the liberal West, the supposedly people of goodwill of the West, give more fuel to the conflict by telling Palestinians, don't compromise with Israel, keep your dream alive, the dream that one day you will have all of Palestine from the river to the sea. We will help you keep this dream alive, but that actually only gives fuel uh, to the conflict and pushes pieces ever further away. Peace. Peace. But we, we are seeing a slight change in the surrounding Arab perspectives towards Israel. Um, can you comment a little bit about specific examples of that and why it might be happening? So I am fascinated by the changes in the Arab world. Um, broadly to say what is happening right in the Arab world, I call it the Ottoman Spring 100 years delayed. Because this is what would have happened 100 years ago had the British and French not intervened to carve up the Ottoman Empire. What we would have had, as every place where empires collapsed or declined, is a land grab among various peoples and sects and nations and tribes for the, em for the land of the empire. So that's what we're seeing now, and it's going to last a while. But in this process, Israel suddenly doesn't matter so much. Uh, the Arabs in their various forms, the sects, the religions, are much more concerned about protecting, defending their possibility to exist in this land grab free for all situation. Uh, and all of a sudden Israel is almost sidelined. Uh, we're at the margins of this area, we don't matter so much. And to some countries we even appear more and more as a stable ally, such as Jordan, even the Palestinian Authority, by the way, Egypt certainly, uh, Saudi Arabia. 
Now, what I'm surprised, or not surprised, but what I'm interested in is that as Arab leaders and Muslim leaders go through this process of thinking differently about Israel, they're also beginning to change the Arab and Islamic historical narrative. Saudi Arabia, for the first time ever, published uh, a kind of statement for International Holocaust Remembrance Day, calling Holocaust denial something that no Arab person should defend. And Holocaust denial is rampant throughout the Arab and Islamic world. Uh, so that's an amazing statement. You're seeing some Arab clerics, Muslim clerics saying things like being against Israel is un-Islamic or that Jerusalem uh, has, you know, uh, that as part of being Muslim, one should recognize the Jews as an indigenous people who have come home or people have a connection to Jerusalem. Now, these are still few and far between. These are rare occurrences. But when we will see more and more of them, when, when that becomes the more dominant story rather than one that is dominant now of Israel as an evil temporary aberration presence, uh, we will know that peace is around the corner. I, I hope it is around the corner. Uh, thank you very much for joining us sure. here on Jeffers Street in Jerusalem. Yes. Uh, your book is on wolf.org. Yes. Uh, and we hope you come to New Zealand again very soon. I'd like that. Thank you. Sure. Thank you very much.